What up, y'all? It's boy, Mr. Dan Tan, I'm Ray Mello, and you're listening to the Entertainment Report on iHeartRadio, live from Dubai for Monday, November 7th, 2016, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, facebook.com slash the Entertainment Report with Ray Mello, that's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, on Twitter at the Enter Report, or on Instagram at the Entertainment Report. You can listen to the show anytime you want on iHeartRadio, just go to iHeart.com or your iHeart phone app, search for the Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. I hope everyone had a fantastic weekend. Batman is feeling lonely and is in need of some friends in the latest trailer for the upcoming Warner Bros. action comedy, The Lego Batman Movie. The clip released Friday features Will Arnett voicing the Lego version of the Cape Crusader, living a solitary life inside his mansion after fighting crime on the streets of Gotham. Noted trusted butler, Alfred voiced by Ralph Fiennes, Master Bruce, your greatest fear is being a part of a family again. He continues, sir, you need to take responsibility for your own life, and it starts by raising the young orphan you adopted. Referencing to the colorful and positive Robin, voiced by Michael Cera. After discovering the Batcave and acquiring his own superhero outfit, Robin then joins Batman as he takes on the Joker, played by Zach Galifianakis, and teams up with new police commissioner Barbara Gordon, played by Rosario Dawson, and Alfred to form a new crime-fighting team. The synopsis reads from the film, There are big changes brewing in Gotham, and if he wants to save the city from the Joker's hostile takeover, Batman may have to drop the lone vigilante thing, try to work with others, and maybe, just maybe, learn to lighten up. Directed by Chris McKay, the Lego Batman movie opens in theaters February 10th, 2017. IFC Film says it has acquired the U.S. right to Werner Herzog's Queen of the Desert and plans to release the drama this spring. Written and directed by Herzog, the film stars Nicole Kidman, James Franco, Robert Pattinson, and Damian Lewis. It is based on the true story of British explorer, cartographer, and archaeologist Gertrude Bell. IFC Films said in a statement, The entire team at IFC is thrilled to be working once more with Werner Herzog, who is undoubtedly a modern master of cinema. Having previously worked with him on his award-winning Caves of Forgotten Dreams, Werner continues to bring innovation, elegance, and poignancy to each of his films, and his latest work is no exception. Emmy Award-winning actor Rami Malik of Mr. Robot fame is to play late Queen frontman Freddie Mercury in the biopic Bohemian Rhapsody. X-Men Apocalypse director Brian Singer is to helm the new Regency and Fox project, which Anthony McCartan wrote and Graham King is producing Variety reported. Sasha Baron Cohen was initially set to star in the long gestating project, but he dropped out. Mercury's original bandmates Brian May and Roger Taylor will serve as music producers on the film. Uh, Singer captioned a photo of the real-life Will Rock You and Under Pressure band in an Instagram post Friday. Brian J. Singer, hashtag Bohemian Rhapsody, hashtag Queen, hashtag Freddie Mercury, hashtag Brian May, hashtag Roger Taylor, hashtag John Deacon, hashtag Graham King, hashtag Fox, hashtag New Regency. Looking forward to at Ram Malik at who is Mr. Robot play hashtag Freddie photo at the real Mick Rock. Oscar-winning actor Eddie Redmayne admits he feels a little smidge of anxiety playing the lead in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. The Harry Potter prequel is set in 1920s New York and follows the globe-trotting adventures of Redmayne's character, the renowned mazoologist Newt Scalamander. The screenplay was penned by J.K. Rowling, the creator of the Potter books and movies. Asked at a recent global fan event of, for the film if he felt an intense responsibility to the Wizarding World fans since Rowling has created a mythical world so many treasure. Remy confessed, the honest answer is I feel enormous pressure, but that bridge is kind of what I'm saying before. We were all fans and we all grew up watching these films, and for me, getting to go and see a Potter film every couple of years was like diving into that warm, cozy place that made you happy about the world. I'm sure you guys relate too, so we had quite high expectations on ourselves. We didn't want to screw it up, but once we read the script, and once you realized it was all those things that you were familiar with in J.K. Rowling's world, all that of everyday magic. The actor went on to recall how he one day was wandering around the beast set and went to check out a newspaper stand meant to appear in the background of a scene. To his surprise, the newspapers featured actual intricate and well-written articles on every page, not just the covers, even though it was not likely they would be seen on camera. He says that detail was just so intoxicating that I actually found that quite invigorating and so the pressure actually decreased for a moment and it's only now when I'm meeting people and people are saying, how are you dealing with the pressure? 
that I started to really feel it again. The movie was to open nationwide on November 18th. Miles Teller gave an update Wednesday on the Divergent finale. The 29-year-old actor who plays Peter Hayes in the film series said in an interview with E! News that he and co-star Shailene Woodley, Theo James, and Ansel Elgort remain unconfirmed for Ascendant given its rumor move to TV. Teller admitted, I don't know what will happen. You go online and they say, last one being made into a TV movie and no cast is confirmed and that's where it's at. He also added, I have not talked to anybody. We haven't filmed one in like a year and a half. My phone's not ringing for it, so I don't know. The Hollywood Reporter had reported in July that Ascendant may skip theaters in favor of a TV movie or series. The move was largely attributed to the underwhelming box office numbers for the latest film, Allegiant, which opened in March. Uh, Woodley, who portrays Tris Pryor, told Scream Rant in September, Last I heard, they were trying to make it into a television show. I didn't set up to be in a television show. She also added, Out of respect to the studios and everyone involved, they have changed their minds and may be doing something different, but I'm not necessarily interested in doing a television show. The Divergent series has earned a total of $764 million at the box office thus far. Teller will next star in the boxing drama Bleed for This, which opens on November 18th. And is also slated for Thank You for Your Service with Haley Bennett. Quentin Tarantino has once again declared his plans to retire after he directs two more films for a grand total of ten. The filmmaker said Thursday of retiring after his tenth film while being interviewed on stage at the Adobe Max conference in San Diego, according to Ohio Reporter. Drop the mic, boom, tell everybody, match that shit. Wow. Tarantino hasn't officially announced his next film following 2015's The Hateful Eight. The 53-year-old mentioned during the event that he is working on a historical 1970s-based nonfiction project that could be a book, a documentary, a five-part podcast. Notably, when asked what success means to him, Tarantino responded, Hopefully the way I define success is when I finish with the career I consider one of the greatest filmmakers who ever lived. He continued, that would be successful, and then to go further than that, I would be considered a great artist and not just a film director. Tarantino first announced his plans to retire after completing 10 films back in November of 2014. He said at the time, I do think directing is a young man's game. I'm not trying to ridicule anyone who thinks differently, but I want to go out while I'm still hard. Last December, Tarantino revealed his desire to release a Western television series based on the Elmore Leonard novel, 40 Lashes Less One. Netflix is teasing new details about the second season of its breakout hit, Stranger Things. The streaming service tweeted an upside-down black-and-white photo of the child and teen stars who will return for season two, along with the message, back in production, see you next year, hashtag Stranger Things. Picture were Finn Wolfhard, Molly Bobby Brown, Gaitlin Matrazano, Caleb McNaughlin, Nora Schnapp, Natalia Dwyer, Charlie Heaton, and Joe Keery, as well as newcomers Sadie Sink and Darcy Montgomery. It is unclear whether Season 1 veterans Winona Ryder, David Harbour, and Matthew Modine will return because they were not in the photo. Netflix announced in August it ordered a second season of the beloved sci-fi series, but did not confirm until now who would be in it. The nine fresh episodes are scheduled to debut in 2017. Sorry, it will take place in the fall of 1984. Writer, creators, Matt and Ross Duffer are back to helm the sophomore edition, but no plot details have been officially revealed yet. The streaming service described the 1983 set first season, which focused on the disappearance of a young boy and his friends and family's effort to save him, as a love letter to the supernatural classics of the 80s. Showtime has released a teaser trailer for season six of its thriller series Homeland. The synopsis accompanies a two-minute clip on YouTube. Several months after she was throughout a terrorist attack in Berlin, Carrie Matheson is living in New York, where she's begun working to provide aid to Muslims living in the United States. The haunting music in the teaser trailer is Tamara's version of Phil Collins' classic song, In the Air Tonight, starring Claire Danes, Rupert Friend, F. Murray Abraham, Elizabeth Marvel, and Man- Mandy Patakin. The show is to return with fresh episodes January 15th. The small screen version of the international thrill Taken starring Clive Standen is set to debut on NBC February 27th. The show will immediately follow the premiere of the spring cycle of the musical competition series The Voice. 
Uh, Entertainment Chairman Robert Greenblatt said in a statement, Monday nights are critical to our success and we're going strong into the rest of the season with the return of The Voice in February followed by the premiere of Taken along with additional episodes of our greatest new series, Timeless. We're very happy to welcome Gwen Stefani back to The Voice along with Blake Shelton, Adam Levine and our newest coach, Alicia Keys. And Taken is a thrilling new series inspired by the hit movie franchise but updated in a very clever way. The fall time travel drama Timeless starring Abigail Spencer, Matt Lattner, Malcolm Barrett, Gorian Viznik, Patterson Joseph, Sakina Jaffrey, and Claudia Dumond recently got a full season order that means episodes will air through early 2017. Comedy legend Dave Chappelle will host Saturday Night Live for the first time next week. NBC announced in the press release Friday that the 43-year-old actor and comedian will host the show's November 12th episode featuring musical guest A Tribe Called Quest. The series confirmed on its official Twitter page, Dave Chappelle and at ATCQ are here next week, hashtag SNL. The episode will air a day after the release of A Tribe Called Quest's first album in 18 years. The trio who last debuted the Love Movement in 1998 will release We Got It From Here. Thank you for your service on November 11th. Chappelle had nothing but praise on Saturday Night Live at the show's 40th anniversary special in 2015. The actor told a rap that the late night sketch comedy series has been, quote, a hotbed of many, many comedy moments. He says it has been a place for a lot of great entertainers to hone their skills and find a way to bridge the gap between being a nightclub act and entertaining the masses. Chappelle is known for The Chappelle Show, which ran from 2003 to 2006 on Comedy Central and has appeared in numerous stand-up comedy specials. The actor last appeared in the 2015 movie um, Chick Rack, starring Tayana Parrish. Comedian Dana Carvey returned to Saturday Night Live this weekend as one of his most famous characters, the church lady. Current cast member Colin Joss introduced the SNL icon during the weekend update fog news and commentary segment of the sketch comedy series. Church lady then proceeded to offer her take on the 2016 presidential campaign. The notoriously judgmental church lady asked, It's a tough decision we have on Tuesday, isn't it, Colin? Do we vote for a bitter female android from the 90s or a riverboat gambler with a big tummy and an orange head? Pressed to divulge if she has chosen a candidate yet, she replies, Jesus is not on the ballot, Colin. She then predicted Joss would write in his favorite, his favorite candidate, Satan, when he goes to vote. Church Lady also insisted she remains hopeful for the country's future and treated the audience to her rendition of What a Wonderful World. With unflattering photos of Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Vladimir Putin, Anthony Weiner, and Rudy Giuliani flash on the screen. Harvey was an SNL cast member from 1986 to 1993 and has returned to guest host the program four times. Alec Baldwin and Kay McKinnon reprised their roles of Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton for the final episode of Saturday Night Live before Tuesday's presidential election. After the pair traded insults for several minutes, Baldwin broke character and said, I'm sorry, Kate, I just hate yelling all of this stuff at you like this. McKinnon agreed, yeah, I know, right? This whole election has been so mean. Uh, Baldwin continued asking the studio audience, I mean, I feel so gross all the time. Don't you guys feel gross about all of this? McKinnon said with a smile, you know what I think can help us? Let's go out there. Baldwin asked, what, where, do, where, will, where will we go? To which McKinnon replied, you'll see. McKinnon and Baldwin then clapped their hands and left the studio dresses their characters. Running around New York's Times Square, they hugged unsuspected people wearing political t-shirts and hats, ate snacks from food vendors, and distributed red and white balloons. The outing ended with them dancing in a circle with other New Yorkers and tourists. Returning to the studio, Baldwin told viewers, Now it's time to get out there and vote. None of this would have mattered if you don't, if you don't vote. McKinnon added, We can't tell you who to vote for, but on Tuesday we all get a chance to choose what kind of country we want to live in. Comedian Will Ferrell cut a video on behalf of Hillary Clinton aimed at getting millennials to vote by pretending to be one of them. Farrell, in a minute-long video shared on Clinton's official social media accounts, trade on all manners of hip kid speech and internet shor shorthand. 49-year-old said, I'm Will Ferrell, actor, comedian, and typical run-of-the-mill millennial, standing with a group of 20-somethings. He said, uh, let's all put down our Snapchat, Tinder, Instagram, and other app-based technologies for a minute so we can keep it 100, while appearing to talk on a flip phone and referencing to the ubiquitous red 100 emojis that comes to symbolize general awesomeness. By this time he was done, there was hardly a millennial reference left untapped. Uh, he says, our voting record is public record. Yeah, that's right, babe. 
whether we vote or not is available online for any of our fellow millennial friends to see, or even worse, our parents. If you don't vote, everyone might find out you're the opposite of on fleek, or that you're basic, or even worse, that you've got no chill. All this on top of what was a serious case of MOFO. Uh, MOFO stands for fear of missing out. The video concludes with Farrell talking between takes, making fun of himself for not knowing what Tinder is. It's a popular app that allows users to swipe right if they want to meet someone. Lin-Manuel Miranda, the creator of the breakout Broadway hit Hamilton, released a track list of the upcoming star-studded Hamilton mixtape album, which features covers of the musical's songs. Miranda tweeted a photo of the album back on Thursday along with the caption, But wait, there's more. He also announced the album will be available pre-order starting Friday, featuring performances from Sia, Usher, The Roots, Kelly Clarkson, Regina Spector, Jill Scott, and John Legend, among others. The album will also include songs that didn't make it to the Broadway show. Miranda tweeted, I'm just so happy you're happy after the overwhelming social media response to the announcement. We've all lost so much sleep making this for you. I don't know the words for this gratitude. Pokemon Go is hoping to reignite fever over the game with a new update that offers daily bonuses for players who log into the game and play on a regular basis. The newest update gives players a chance to earn more experience and collect some of the elusive Stardust, which is used to power up Pokemon. Players can now earn 500 XP and 600 Stardust for catching one Pokemon every day. Additionally, the game now offers 2,000 XP and 2,000 uh, 2,400 Stardust for catching a Pokemon seven days in a row. The game now also rewards visits to Pokestops with daily visits earning 500 XP and more items than before and a 2,000 XP bonus for visiting a Pokestop seven days in a row. Nintanic, the game's creators, have also made a change to the kind of Pokemon players will regularly encounter after complaints of too many Pidgeotty, Ratatata, and Subat Pokemon. Natanic uh, tweeted Thursday, You may encounter other Pokemons where Pidgeotty, Rattata, and Subat were previously more commonly found. In an open letter, Mila Kunis confronted sexism in Hollywood and her own experience with gender bias, saying she's done compromising. Kunis details two specific experiences in which she said she'd been insulted, sidelined, paid less, creatively ignored, and otherwise diminished based on my gender. One instance involved the producer's threat that she'd never work in this town again for refusing to appear semi-naked on the cover of a men's magazine. She wrote, I was no longer willing to subject myself to a naive compromise that I had previously been willing to. I will never work in this town again. I was livid. I felt objectified, and for the first time in my career, I said no. And guess what? The world didn't end. The film made a lot of money, and I did work in this town again and again and again. What this producer may never realize is that he spoke aloud the exact fear every woman feels when confronted with gender bias in the workplace. Kunis described the second instance in which, even after she started her own successful production company, she was reduced nothing more than my relationship to be a successful man and my ability to bear children by a network executive who referred to her as soon-to-be Ashton's wife and baby mama. Uh, she said of the exec's response, Yes, it is only a small common, but... It's these very comments that women deal with day in and day out in offices, on calls, or in emails. Microaggressions that they value the contributions and worth of hard women. Kunis vowed to no longer overlook the instances in when she feels she's being discriminated. She said, I'm done compromising even more so. I'm done with being compromised. So from this point forward, when I'm confronted with one of these comments, subtle or overt, I will address them head on. Kunis's letter was originally published on Medium and then picked up by A Plus magazine. Kunis says she hopes to become a voice for solidarity and change. She says, if this, ha- if this is happening to me, it's happening more aggressively to women everywhere. I'm fortunate that I have reached a place that I can stop compromising and stand my ground without fearing how I will put food on my table. I'm also fortunate that I have the platform to talk about this experience in the hope of bringing one more voice to the conversation so that women in the workplace feel a little less alone and more able to push back for themselves. Film star Brad Pitt has filed his response to his estranged wife Angelina Jolie's petition for divorce. People Magazine says the legal paper, State Pitt, is seeking joint physical custody of his six children with the Oscar winner. Jolie previously asked for sole physical custody of the kids ages 8 to 15 with visitation rights for Pitt. A family source told the magazine, 
Brad and Angie haven't had any contact, and it's all being worked out of via their teams. It's just a sad situation. Uh, Swigley said Julie first filed for divorce from Pitt on September 19th, just days after she and Pitt separated. The couple split after more than a decade together, reportedly because of a heated com- confrontation between Pitt and their oldest child, Maddox, who's 15. Singer Michael Bublé announced on Facebook that his three-year-old son, Noah, is currently undergoing treatment for cancer. Bublé said in a statement, We are devastated about the recent cancer diagnosis of our oldest son, Noah, who is currently undergoing treatment in the U.S. Bublé said that he and his wife, Luciana Lupilato, are putting everything on hold to focus on Noah's treatment. He says, Luciana and I have put our careers on hold in order to devote all of our time and attention to helping Noah get well. Bublé says, at this difficult time, we ask only for your prayers and respect for our privacy. We have a long journey in front of us and hope that with the support of family, friends, and fans around the world, we will win this battle, God willing. Bublé and Lupilato, who married in 2011, are also have a nine-month son, a nine-month-old son named Elias. BBC 2 upcoming documentary about the final years of David Bowie's life is set to air in January and coincide with the late singer's 70th birthday. David Bowie, The Last Five Years, is the follow-up to director Francis Watley's 2013 film David Bowie, Five Years. It will feature Bowie's last three projects, the album The Next Day and Black Star and the musical Lazarus. The BBC said in a statement, this new piece will feature a wealth of rare and unseen archival footage and early audio interview which have never been released before. This includes the original vocal, which Bowie recorded for Lazarus, his last release before his death, which has never been heard before. The film is scheduled to air in January as a celebration of what would have been the legendary singer's 70th birthday. Bowie died of liver cancer on January 10th. Gigi Hadid and Jay Farrow will host the 2016 American Music Awards. 21-year-old model confirmed as much Friday on Twitter after ABC announced the news in a press release earlier in the day. Hadid and Farrow will host the annual ceremony November 20th at the Microsoft Theater in Los Angeles. The award show will be broadcast live on ABC beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hadid said in a statement, I'm so excited to host the 2016 AMAs with Jay Farrow. Jay is known for his spot-on impressions, so I can't wait to take the stage with him to show my goofy side and celebrate this year's nominees. Farrow added, can't wait to host the AMAs with the beautiful Gigi Hadid. So much innocence in her eyes and being in the building with some of my industry friends, who I've probably impersonated at some point, I'm sure. It's going to be a fun night. ABC has revealed the day previous that recording artist The Weeknd, John Legend, Ariana Grande and Nicki Minaj will perform at the show. Lady Gaga, Fifth Harmony, and Bruno Mars are among the other stars slated to sing. Hadid is known for her modeling work with guests Tommy Hilfiger and Victoria's Secret. Farrow starred on Saturday Night Live for six years and has also appeared in Ride Along, Top 5, and Get a Job. Marvel's superhero picture Doctor Strange starring Benedict Cumberbatch is the number one movie in North America. After earning $85 million in receipts this weekend, box office Mojo.com announced Sunday. Coming in at number two is Trolls with $45.6 million, followed by Hacksaw Ridge at number three with $14.8 million, Boo and Medea Halloween at number four with $7.8 million, and Inferno at number five with $6.3 million. Running out the top tier are The Accountant at number six with $6 million, Jack Reacher, Never Go Back, at number 7 with $5.6 million. Yoji, Origin of Evil, at number 8 with $4 million. The Girl on the Train, at number 9 with $2.8 million. And Ms. Pillar Green's Home for Peculiar Children, at number 10 with $2.1 million. And now let's take a look at what happened on this date in entertainment history. On this date in 1980, Steve McQueen, one of Hollywood's leading men of the 1960s and 1970s, and the star of such action thrillers as Bullet and The Towering Inferno, dies at the age of 50 in Mexico, where he was undergoing an experimental treatment for cancer. In 1979, McQueen had been diagnosed with mesothelioma, a type of cancer often related to asbestos exposure. It was later believed that the regularly handsome actor, who had an affinity for fast cars and motorcycles, might have been exposed to asbestos by wearing racing suits. Terrence Stephen McQueen was born on March 24, 1930 in Beach Grove, Indiana. After a troubled youth that included time in a reform school, McQueen served in the U.S. military corps in the 40s. He then studied acting and began competing in motorcycle races. He made his big screen debut with the tiny role in 1956, Somebody Up There Likes Me, starring Paul Newman. McQueen went on to appear in the classic 
Camp movie, The Blob, in 1958, and gained fame playing a bounty hunter in the TV series Wanted Dead or Alive, which originally aired on CBS from 1958 to 1961. During the 1960s, McQueen built a reputation for playing cool loner heroes in a list of films that included the western The Magnificent Seven in 1960, which was directed by John Sturges and featuring Bill Brenner and Charles Bronson. Great Escape in 1963, in which McQueen played a U.S. soldier in World War II who makes a daring motorcycle escape from a German prison camp, and The Sam Peoples in 1966, a war epic for which he received the Best Actor Oscar nomination. McQueen played a detective in one of his most popular movies, 1968 Bullet, which featured the spectacular car chase through the streets of San Francisco. That same year, the actor portrayed an elegant thief in The Thomas Crown Affair. In the 1970s, McQueen was one of the Hollywood's highest paid actors and starred in hit films such as director Sam Peckinpah's The Getaway in 1972 with Ali McGraw, to whom McQueen was married from 1973 to 1978. Papillion with Dustin Hoffman in 1973 and The Towering Inferno in 1974 with Paul Newman, William Holden, and Faye Dunaway. In the summer of 1980, McQueen traveled to Rosarito Beach, Mexico, where he underwent an unorthodox cancer treatment that involved, among other things, coffee enemas and a therapy derived from apricot pits. On November 6, 1980, he had surgery to remove cancerous masses from his body. He died the following day. His final films were Tom Horn and The Hunter, both of which were released in 1980. Also on this date in 1991, basketball legend Magic Johnson holds a press conference to announce that he has HIV, a virus that causes AIDS, and is retiring from the Los Angeles Lakers. From then on, he said he would focus on staying healthy and on helping people, especially young people, understand the importance of practicing, uh, practicing safe sex. He says, you think it can never happen to you, that it, happen, that it happens only to other people. But if it can happen to Magic Johnson, it can happen to anybody. In 1991, many people diff- didn't understand the difference between HIV and AIDS, and they thought that either one was a certain death sentence. When Johnson's fans and friends heard the news, many were convinced he would die within a year or two. They were stunned and heartbroken. They did what they could to mourn. For example, Pat Riley, the coach of the, of the New York Knicks, delayed his team's opening tip so that he could read the Lord's Prayer to the crowd. Johnson himself tried to be optimistic, but even he wasn't sure what the news meant. I'll live, he says, I won't die, and if I do die, I'll be happy, I've had a great life. But it soon became clear that he wasn't going to die, not yet anyway. He didn't, feel, he didn't even feel sick. God do- good doctors and careful calibrated medications kept his viral low, so, uh, load so low that it was once detectable in his blood. And once he'd gotten over the shock of his diagnosis, Johnson realized that he missed basketball. He played at the All-Star Game at the end of the 1991-1992 season, leading the West to a 153-113 victory and winning the game's MVP award. He played on the gold medaling winning Dream Team at Barcelona Olympics that summer. He thought about returning to the Lakers the next fall. He even went to training camp with the team, but some NBA players, notably Carl Malone of the Utah Jazz, refused to play against someone who had the AIDS virus. They feel that contact with Johnson's skin or sweat might make them sick too, even though doctors had shown that it was impossible to get HIV that way. So instead of heading back to the basketball court, Johnson went into business. He built Magic Johnson movie theaters, Starbucks coffees, shops, and fat burger franchises in troubling uh, inner city neighborhoods. He wrote a book on safe sex. He bought a percentage of the Los Angeles Lakers and served as the team's head coach for a few games during the 1993-1994 season. And in 1996, he decided to try another comeback. This time, his, his teammates and opponents were happy to have him. He was heavier and slower than he had been in his prime. He was 37 after all, but he was still an intimate, intimidated player. He played with the Lakers for 44 games in 1996, and then he retired for good. And that is your entertainment report for Monday, November 7th, 2016. I'm your host, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello. I'll be back tomorrow to deliver some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Facebook.com slash The Entertainment Report with Ray Mello. That's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O on Twitter at The Enter Report, or on Instagram at The Entertainment Report. You can listen to this episode or any previous episodes of The Entertainment Report anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com or your iHeart phone app, search for The Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. Good night, and God bless you all.